So welcome to the fourth talk in our series on the medieval church. And at the beginning I would like to recap the very fascinating story of the Carolingian Empire, especially its rise under Charlemagne, and the reforms Charlemagne introduced for the church in his vast territory. And I'd like to begin with, well, the culmination of Charlemagne's reign, which was his coronation as emperor in the year 800. On Christmas Day, actually, Charlemagne was in Rome and took part in Mass at St. Peter's, and at that occasion was crowned by Pope Leo III, emperor, raised to the rank of emperor. He had already been king of the Franks since um, 1768, but was given the imperial title by the Pope, which was a very significant event because there hadn't been an emperor in the West since the fall of the Western Roman Empire towards the end of the 5th century, but there was still an emperor in the Eastern Roman Empire, in Byzantium, in Constantinople, and before that alliance between the papacy and the Frankish rulers, the papacy was really to a certain extent linked with the Byzantine Empire, certainly politically, Rome was still part of the Byzantine Empire, but also more widely, culturally, spiritually, Rome looked towards the East, but with the creation of a new Western Empire, there was definite turn towards well, Western Europe and Northern Europe. And this new empire was meant to be a renewed Roman Empire as a Christian empire. So Charlemagne saw himself very much as a Christian Roman emperor. He offered protection and support for the papacy and in return was given legitimacy for his ambitions by the Pope himself. And his, uh, Charlemagne's biographer, Einhard, uh, writes in his life of Charlemagne throughout his whole reign Charlemagne's reign, the wish that he had the nearest to heart was to re-establish the ancient authority of the city of Rome under his care and by his influence, and one could add, as a Christian Rome. There are two ideas that are really very important for the whole of medieval history. One is the idea of Rome, so the renewal and the continued presence of Rome in the entity which would later be known as the Holy Roman Empire, which was essentially uh, Germany and the surrounding territories. That term is a later medieval term, which was not used in Charlemagne's time. Also, Charlemagne's reign was still bigger. It included what would be modern France, northern Italy, low countries, and so on. But the concept was already present, the presence of a Christian Roman Empire. The other great idea was that of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the holy city, city where the life of our Lord uh, took place, was also very, a very strong force in the imagination of medieval people and came more, more and more into uh, the into view uh, as uh, history progressed. But for the moment, we will focus on this idea of reviving the Roman world, Roman Greek culture, language, but always in a Christian key. And Charlemagne attempted that in the vast territory which he had made his own. He was a very skilled uh, uh, military leader, so he extended Frankish territory considerably until it encompassed this sort of area. He pushed it also further um, into Eastern Europe. And he united that quite diverse and uh, fragmented uh, vast territory under the sign of uh, Christianity. Now, uh, Charlemagne's great project really was a Christianization of every individual. He saw himself as a sacred king, sacred emperor, who had also the religious duty to what, lead every one of his subjects to uh, salvation and to bring them to a consistent practice of the Christian faith. So he wanted to achieve this really by an education in the faith. Now, there's one stark exception to that, and that is the forced baptism of the Saxons. In one of his campaigns against the, the Saxons, who 
occupied the territory of sort of north, northeastern Germany today. Uh, the Saxons were still pagans. Um, Charlemagne, Charlemagne defeated them and then had them forcefully baptized. And that act of baptism was really also linked with an act of, of loyalty to him, Charlemagne. And that is often cited as really an example of a forced Christianization of, imposed by the ruler, but actually it was really an exception in, in Charlemagne's long reign, and interestingly attracted criticism of his contemporaries. For example, Alcuin, the Anglo-Saxon scholar at Charlemagne, Charlemagne's court, was extremely critical of that forced baptism of the Saxons, because he thought it, it, wasn't, it wasn't proper, you can't really force fully baptize someone against their conscience. So um, this was really more an exception than the rule in Charlemagne's um, reign. So he wanted to restate classical uh, culture as a Christian culture. For that purpose, he issued well two important documents. One is the so-called Admonitio Generalis, or General Admonition, in the year 789, a document in which he legislates church reform where he basically wants to uh, promote a renewal of, of the church's life, of the level of Christian practice throughout his reign, educational standards, the command of Latin among the clergy, um, also liturgy. He was very keen on, uh, well, on the church's divine worship. He sees himself in that Admonitio Generalis as a new Josiah, Josiah the uh, king of the Old Testament who actually centralizes worship in Israel on the temple in Jerusalem, and reforms worship and centralizes it on the temple of Jerusalem. So Charlemagne sees himself as a new Josiah and the Franks as a new Israel, a new people of Israel. He himself was quite a devout man. He went to mass every day, evening service of Vespers every day, um, and uh, saw it as his sacred duty also to promote Christianity among his people. By means of, as I said, um, raising, raising their spiritual and uh, religious and moral um, uh, standards. So it's that admonition, Admonitio Generalis, and also a letter to uh, the abbot of Fulda, Fulda, great center of uh, Christianity at the time, the place where the tomb of St. Boniface still is. Uh, again, there was an impetus for cultural um, reform there. One part of that project was the, the acquisition of normative texts, good sort of texts that would provide a foundation for, well, for biblical studies. So good texts are the Latin Bible, for canon law, so a, a reliable text of the collection of canons in the church's tradition. Um, liturgical texts, a, a, a sacramentary precursor of the Missal that would actually uh, of a reliable, correct uh, liturgical texts. Correctio was one of his great aims, sort of having actually texts that were written in good, correct Latin that could be uh, understood by everyone who was schooled in uh, Latin. Also, uh, there's a question that came up uh, last week. The Gregorian chant is really a product of this period. Um, when the popes uh, traveled to uh, Northern Europe, to France, or Western Europe to France, to uh, legitimize the Frankish rulers, anoint them as kings, they brought singers with them, and um, they sang in their own tradition of Roman chant, which at the time was quite different from, well, what we know as Gregorian chant. There are some books of Roman chant from a later period. At that time, they weren't yet sort of codified, but uh, transmitted by oral tradition. So these books are considerably later, but we believe that they more or less accurately give us an idea of what Roman chant would have been earlier. So it's quite different from Gregorian chant. It's similar in, its, in the structure of the melodies, but it's much more ornate um, as, as chant melodies go. Um, now, the, the Carolingian rulers, first Pippin, but then Charlemagne, wanted to introduce Roman chant throughout their territories. They actually legislated that the native Gallican <coughs> chant should be replaced with Roman chant. But what actually happened was that Roman chant was adapted in Frankish um, churches by, mon by monks, by the um, cathedral singers, and uh, what we know as Gregorian chant developed, which certainly offers a kind of different aesthetic from the Roman chant. Uh, 
said the melodies are often the same, uh, but with less ornamentation, with less sort of rhetorical flourish, perhaps it's fair to say there is a great, um, um, a great sense of, of recollection, also more meditative sense that is present in many of these Gregorian melodies. But that's really the period when Gregorian chant develops. Our earliest sources for Gregorian chant are just text sources, so just the text of the chants, which probably had some um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, how do you say, monotic mem function. So uh, it's quite likely that particular texts were associated with particular mem melodies and could be sort of memorized just by, uh, uh, associate, mem melodies could be memorized by associating uh, them with text. But culture was still to a large extent an oral culture. So transmission of knowledge happened uh, orally, not through written documents. And this remains for some time as we move further on in the Middle Ages, there's a development towards a written culture, towards codification, towards writing things down, more and more so. But in the early Middle Ages, a lot still happens in oral transmission, sort of teaching from the person to person, memorization. And that certainly um, holds for the Carolingian um, period. A lot of Charlemagne's cultural effort, efforts were focused on the church, so, so most of the art which we still have from his period is ecclesiastical art, sacred art. So um, we have a, a renewal of, of the visual arts, um, reliquaries, uh, gold and silver liturgical objects, book covers, I gave you some examples. So for example, to have you have this magnificent cover of the golden manuscript, the gospel manuscript from the monastery of St. Emmeron in Regensburg in, in Bavaria. Um, this is very much um, pleased, sort of Germanic aesthetic sense of this kind of costly brilliance, the use of, of, of jewels and precious stones. But at the same time, uh, you had um, uh, a renewal of, of classical, i.e. Roman, uh, forms of art in manuscripts, um, illustrations, in ivories, ivory carvings. There's still quite a lot of Carolingian ivories around you. The next door, the Victoria Dalbert Museum, you can see some of them. And often the, the, the way the human figure is, is portrayed um, sort of consciously sort of uh, connects with uh, the models of Roman antiquity. So, for example, some of these um, gospel manuscripts. The great architectural monument from Charlemagne's reign was, is the uh, Palatine Chapel in Aachen, now the Cathedral of the Diocese of Aachen, which again uh, connects with examples of Roman and Byzantine architecture, uh, for example the, the churches of Ravenna and uh, Charlemagne actually deliberately organized um, the, the transfer of Roman of marbles from, from Italy, marble which obviously you don't find uh, in that part of Germany, but no effort was spared to um, evoke that sense of a renewal of Rome also north of the Alps. Now this um, cultural and also religious impetus continued even while the actual empire was disintegrated. The um, Carolingian Empire didn't uh, survive long after the death of Charlemagne, but uh, the sort of cultural uh, and religious impulse continued even in the time of political disintegration. So some of these works which I showed you, some of these manuscripts are actually from a later period, from the later 9th century, when um, the Carolingian rulers didn't have the same power as, as Charlemagne, but uh, the cultural uh, impetus still carried on. But now I want to move on to the disintegration of the Carolingian Empire. Now, the Carolingian Empire was built on a fragile political and economic base. 
This became evident, especially in the 840s. And so two generations after Charlemagne, really that empire disintegrated. There were a number of reasons for that. Some of them were internal. One reason was that the Franks um, did not have the principle of primogeniture, which later uh, was practiced in, in many, most European countries, i.e. the principle that um, the firstborn son of a ruler of a king would inherit uh, the reign. So this was not the case among the uh, Franks, but every able-bodied son would inherit an equal portion from his father. So uh, the territory would have to be divided among the surviving able-bodied sons of the ruler. This was already the practice of the Merovingian kings, the dynasty before, and was one of the factors why Merovingian rule had become so weak, because these the sons often fought with one another over, over the division. Now, when Charlemagne died in 814, there had only one surviving son, that was Louis, known as Louis the Pious. And he ruled from 814 to 840. So during that period, the empire was held together because there was actually only one son um, surviving from Charlemagne. Charlemagne died at the age of 72, a very respectable age, and survived actually most of his sons, except for Louis. Now, Louis the Pious had several heirs, several sons, who um, after his death waged war against uh, one another for control of the Frankish territory. And it was finally agreed, actually at Strasbourg, uh, and later at Verdun, uh, there's the, the Strasbourg Oaths, which, which the, these warring brothers were actually taking in 842, and then a treaty in Verdun, in, in modern France, 843, where they divided up um, their territory. Now, and it was finally agreed that um, Charles the Bald would take well, essentially what corresponds to, to modern France, together with the Spanish March, i.e. modern Catalonia. Louis the German would take the eastern part of the Carolingian territory, again, roughly corresponding to modern Germany, and Lothair would take everything in the middle, so the low countries, so what's Burgundy, northern France, and receive the imperial title. So Lothair would actually become emperor, the other two would be kings in their territories, which became known as East Francia and West Francia. So in literature you often read these titles to distinguish them from obviously modern France, you say East Francia and modern Francia. And certainly there was also a linguistic divide, that was another question that came up, and you see that very nicely in the Strasbourg Oaths of 842, when Louis, Louis or Ludwig, as he's also known, Ludwig the, the German, um, and Charles came together and exchanged their vows, and um, so uh, uh, Louis the German in lingua theodisca and uh, Charles the Bald in lingua romana, so precursors really of uh, French and um, German. So um, that vast territory then was really divided up and um, would later develop into well, Germany, France, and obviously the state, the countries um, um, in between, which didn't have the same political uh, sort of unity, and um, um, actually in, often then were sort of disputed between these two powers. I mean, you can actually continue uh, to trace that line until the Second World War, I mean, so the German invasion of the Netherlands, or the, the German invasion of, of, of Belgium in the First World War, so these territories of in between the two uh, stronger uh, powers. Now, that was one reason, so the disintegration of Carolingian territory was one reason for political de um, decline, um, political social decline. Another, um, other reasons were more external. There were so external threats, really, at the time. One by Muslim Arab pirates. See, the, the Mediterranean in Roman times was um, very effectively controlled uh, by the Roman Empire. It was Mare Nostrum, our uh, sea, and was uh, you could uh, traverse it, except for those vicissitudes of, of uh, weather and so on, uh, quite easily. Now, this changed very much in the early medieval period when Muslim Arab pirates were a significant threat. They raided the Mediterranean coastlines, uh, 
in the ninth century for booty, ransom, slaves as well. Uh, was one of the big themes of this, sort of being caught into, into slavery by pirates. In 846, they even captured Rome and looted uh, St. Peter's. And um, in general, they made the coastlines very unsafe. So one reason why, uh, uh, sort of especially sort of coastal towns in southern Italy, um, were not very highly developed was because there was a constant threat from, from these pirates. And only once um, so that, uh, the, the seas were more safe, it was safer, um, then these areas could develop as well. Another threat came from the north. The, um, the, 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 the north men, the Normans, also called Vikings, very uh, skilled sailors, uh, ferocious fighters, and their expeditions, of course, as England, uh, east coast of England, um, north of France, where they eventually settled Normandy. Um, but they, of course, at that time were still, um, were still pagans, still polytheists, and a threat to these various Christian countries. Um, once they actually uh, converted to Christianity, they were a very powerful force within the church, within the north of France, Normandy, then, of course, the uh, in, in England uh, 1066, but also the Norman kingdoms of southern Italy and Sicily were, were very strong, also culturally very, uh, very, very fertile. But at the time, so uh, uh, 10th, 9th, 10th century, they um, well, basically well, destroyed everything that sort of came into their, in their sight, destroyed and looted it, monasteries, uh, and so on. Um, on the continent, there was another significant factor that destabilized uh, the Carolingian rule, and that was that were the Magyars, so modern Hungary, the precursors of the, uh, then the Magyars, who pushed sort of in, in, into uh, Central Europe, and again at the time um, were not yet Christian. The, um, they were sort of decisively defeated in the year 955 by the German king um, Otto I, we get to the Ottonians. If you are um, a fan of the, the operas of Richard Wagner, as I am, and you know Law in Green, that is actually the historical setting for, for, for Law in Green, sort of the threat uh, uh, of the Magyars coming in from, from the east and the call to arms uh, to defend uh, the, the empire against them. And, um, but in 955 they were defeated at the river Lech, so in, in Bavaria, near the Bavarian uh, city of Augsburg today. And so their raids um, ceased. And it was under King Stephen, who venerated the saint, uh, Saint Stephen, in the early 11th century, that the Hungarians converted also to Latin Christianity, an important factor here, because um, further, uh, the, the, the peoples in Eastern Europe uh, more generally converted to uh, Eastern Christianity, or Greek Christianity, Orthodoxy, but the, the Hungarians converted to Latin Christian, Christianity and really became parts of um, Western Christianity. But so you had um, um, a division of the Carolingian Empire essentially into two major parts, East Francia, West Francia, and all that bit um, um, in between, which uh, for some time has uh, still carried the imperial title. Now the, but um, a renewal uh, of, of imperial rule didn't actually took long to um, happen, and um, it took place in the east, what used to be the eastern half of the empire, and now was well, essentially um, Germany. And that renewal of the imperial idea is associated with the dynasty we know as the Ottonians. Ottonians because there were three important rulers, Otto I, Otto II, Otto III. But um, the dynasty was actually established by the Duke of Saxony, Henry the Fowler, who um, was elected sort of king of, of East France, of that part of the Carolingian territory, which later would become Germany. Now, it was really um, his uh, successor, um, Otto I, who consolidated uh, his, uh, that, that territory, who 
um, also um, uh, saw himself as very much as the successor of Charlemagne, and um, who, who kept um, the uh, Magyars at bay. And in fact, the Magyars were really the only significant force that threatened uh, East France, uh, because uh, that, say, say, the German part didn't really have such extended coastline as the French as the French part, so wasn't really so uh, exposed to well, threats from the north, i.e. the Normans, the Vikings, or from the south, the uh, Muslim pirates. So once uh, the sort of Magyars were kept in check in 955, um, Otto could uh, establish a more effective uh, government, uh, also sort of controls sort of peace order in his territory. And for our purpose, um, it is significant that he also saw himself as a, a sacred ruler with a duty to well, look after the church in his territory. Uh, and so, really, um, uh, Otto is at uh, the beginning of what uh, would later come to be known as the sort of imperial church in, in German territory. So, a church that is very closely linked with, uh, well, we can't really say secular government because there wasn't a distinction, a clear distinction between so sacred and secular government. It was seen as one body, one um, entity, but certainly where there was a difference between, say, um, ecclesiastical and civil, but Otto saw himself really as the uh, leader of that whole body uh, politic. So, I mean, it was the king and later the emperor who would appoint um, important leaders, bishops, important abbots, um, would sort of organize the, the, um, uh, the church in his territory, also would make um, uh, bishops, abbots, uh, territorial rulers, they would have a territory, they would be um, actually part of that wonderful sort of um, system that the Holy Roman Empire became, so uh, with a, a, an emperor who was uh, obviously nominally the head, but had often very little power of the different territories that were ruled by, say, a king, a duke, uh, or indeed a prince bishop or uh, a, a prince abbot. So these, these ecclesiastical leaders were very much integrated into the sort of uh, civil power and were also um, a civil, civil leaders in their territory. Now, um, it has to be said that as long as the emperor took that sacred duty seriously and um, maintains what, the church's doctrine, the church's practice and discipline, uh, the can canon law, and didn't just use uh, the system to sort of promote his friends and supporters, family members, or try to uh, give them sort of benefices that would secure them an income, that sort of thing. As long as the uh, kings and emperors took that duty seriously, it worked quite well, and it brought a new flourishing to the church in, in uh, the German territories. Also, um, there was a, a missionary um, uh, impetus towards east, towards the east of Hungary, certainly, once um, King Stephen converted to Christianity, Bohemia, so the modern Czech Republic, and also Poland. So this was uh, the, the time when uh, these areas of Eastern Europe were um, evangelized by so, for, for Western um, uh, Christianity. And um, it is also um, uh, interesting that the Ottonians, uh, so the three Ottos, um, sought ties with Byzantium. They sought ties with the Eastern Roman Empire. Greek language, Greek culture was held in very high esteem, and uh, so they were also trying to reconnect uh, the, with um, the, the Greek, uh, well, Byzantine um, Empire and uh, Greek Christianity. So uh, Otto II, uh, who ruled from um, 973 to 983, had married a Byzantine princess, Theophilo, and uh, brought her to, um, uh, to, to Germany. It's quite, quite an amusing account of uh, uh, the impressions of Princess Theophilo. I mean, Byzantium was still very highly developed uh, culture, um, with the Roman heritage still very much alive, whereas customs and, and, and in, in those um, uh, German territories were not quite as sophisticated and refined, and she, uh, I think she had to put up with quite 
quite a lot of those kind of horse habits and uh, uh, customs she found at the German court by comparison to the you know, refinement which she was used from uh, Byzantium. But you know, uh, they, were, they were actually getting there and uh, there was a cultural revival that some historians have styled, styled another renaissance, so another renaissance, this time the Etonian. Um, the term can be overused, obviously, but there is some justification for it. It is um, the period that um, certainly has given us um, some very important monuments. A few Carolingian buildings around in Europe, uh, uh, but uh, Ottonian buildings uh, more so. So, for example, this very magnificent um, Abbey, the Abbey of St. Michael in Hildesheim in northern Germany, which is a fantastic example of uh, Ottonian architecture. Obviously, you see things have been added there, so the Gothic side aisle here, but the, the major structure, especially with these uh, the, the massive western entrance, that's a typical sign of uh, these Ottonian uh, buildings. So, uh, there is certain flourishing of, of religious art, religious architecture. Uh, the, this bronze uh, column from uh, St. Michael's, the Bernward column, which shows uh, the uh, wedding uh, of Cana. So you see development of plastic uh, sort of art, uh, sculpture, and uh, in fact one of the oldest um, uh, uh, sort of three-dimensional crucifixes is from that period. It is the so-called Gero crucifix, uh, which is in Cologne Cathedral. Obviously in the back here that's a Baroque edition, but uh, the, the actual crucifix, uh, the actual body, is dated, well, to the second half of the 10th century, and is one of the oldest of three-dimensional representations of, of the crucified Christ, a typical Western development that uh, the religious of religious uh, sculpture. Um, also, um, um, book illumination flourished at the time. You have a uh, whole uh, so, Many examples of wonderful, again, largely in liturgical manuscripts, so gospel books uh, above all, um, biblical manuscripts in general, that's the so-called Bamberg Apocalypse. Um, Bamberg, an important see in, in southern Germany, in, in Franconia, founded by Henry II. Henry II was the latest, um, the last uh, Ottonian emperor, so the last emperor of the Ottonian dynasty who is venerated as a saint, Saint Henry, just uh, as his wife, Saint Codigand, is also venerated as a saint. Both are buried in Bamberg Cathedral, and Henry founded that see of Bamberg and, and uh, um, gave very generous donations to it. Again, he was very much involved in the uh, uh, running of the church at his time, to the point that he, sort of, all writers at the time styled him as a co-episcopus, a fellow bishop, really. Of course, he wasn't a bishop, but he took so much interest in ecclesiastical affairs and really was so involved in them that he was almost like, uh, like a bishop. And you see him crowned, I mean, it's not quite sure uh, whether this is actually Henry II or whether it is his predecessor, Otto III, There's certainly one of the Ottonians who is crowned um, emperor by Saints Peter and Paul. So again, you see the, the claim to the sacred um, rule, it's the apostles themselves who crown, uh, crown the emperor. So, um, so under the rule of the Ottonians, um, the, uh, you know, the things went actually uh, quite well. The church grew, there were many religious and cultural so artistic centers north of the Alps, so east of the Rhine. When we look into uh, the western half of what used to be the Carolingian <coughs> Empire, things did not go uh, so well, partly because, uh, well, what is now France was much more exposed to these external threats. And um, also political power was, was weak, um, whereas the Ottonians managed to establish a strong rule over their territories. Um, in, in Western France, yeah, this was not the case, so that in general, uh, social order collapsed. So at the coastlines, you had the threats from the Vikings, um, the pirates in the south, and uh, within the territory uh, of West France, yeah, um, the rule of law broke down, and um, local sort of strongmen, local warlords, really, 
dominated um, uh, and re uh, generated continues of sort of cultural violence um, that uh, brought a social, economic, and general uh, decline. No effect of royal control, and uh, that also um, affected the church in that territory um, very much. Now, the, um, at the time, really, I have to uh, introduce really the subject which doesn't, which, which takes us back a few centuries, but um, an important aspect of uh, that period was really the Christianization of the countryside. Christianity started in, in towns, in, in cities. Christianity was at its beginning largely an urban religion and that remained so for some centuries. There's one possible etymology of the word pagan, Pagani, which means those who live in the countryside, but it's not the only one, it's a bit contested, but it would certainly provide a plausible um, explanation because the countryside was only superficially Christianized for a considerable time. Now, in the early Midi Middle Ages, um, that began to change and more attention was actually given to Christianization of the countryside. But well, uh, after, well until about the year 1000 or even after, you did not have a fully developed network of parishes or even simple sort of chapels that would really provide a spiritual pastoral care for the people living in the countryside, let's say resident priests. Um, and a lot of the, so the, these churches and chapels, say, on, on the rural estates where most people at the time lived, were very, very humble. I mean, very, very simple constructions, uh, so you, so no, not even with a resident priest. So uh, spiritual care was, was very patchy. And often it really depended on the local landowner, on the local lord, to, say, build a church for his tenants, uh, to employ a priest, to find a priest, to choose a man he thought um, suitable, offer some sort of training, often minimal training, and then of course get the bishop to, to have him ordained. But um, being that priest being more or less the employee of the of the actual of, of the landowner, and that was certainly the way in which a lot of these places in the countryside became evangelized. Now. Um, that meant that these churches, built, say, by, by the local landowner, by the local aristocrat, were considered privately owned. They were known as private churches. They were under the control of, say, the local landowner. And while the bishop was obviously needed for the sacrament of holy orders, for all practical purposes, many village churches of early medieval Europe were the property of well, their founder and then uh, his heirs. That could be a monastic house, of course, a religious house, a religious community, but it was often a, a lay aristocrat. Even so, sort of late in the Middle Ages, you still have a sim, uh, system of patronage, where the, again the local uh, aristocratic landowner sort of appoints the, uh, let's say, the parish priest or, or vicar in um, um, a village church. Now, um, again, um, as long as uh, these uh, landowners took this responsibility seriously, in the sense of the church's teaching, and discipline, and practice, it worked reasonably well. But it often became an opportunity to, uh, well, appoint uh, someone to an ecclesiastical post so that uh, he could get a regular income, so he could get a living, that his future would be secured, while uh, the actual um, man had very little inclination or preparation to fulfill his clerical and pastoral um, uh, duties. Um, again, canon law was often um, simply ignored or, um, or forgotten. Even in monasteries, uh, the standards of the Benedictine rule, which the Carolingians wanted to be followed, were ignored largely 
Um, positions in the church were often considered hereditary, from sort of, you know, a man to his son and, and so on. Um, it was not unheard of for a, a landowner to seize church property if he was in need of it. And that um, form of corruption affected the western part of the former Carolingian territories much more than uh, the eastern part. So modern France was much more affected by such problems. And um, uh, th this was all, would also provide the background to the great confrontation of the High Middle Ages between the papacy and uh, the German empress, the investiture controversy over precisely the control over these local um, uh, churches. Now, when we look to um, Italy, when we look to the papacy, again, there's a very, um, it's a very particular period. In my introduction, I uh, mentioned that we shouldn't think of the Middle Ages as dark ages, but there certainly were sort of dark ages in between in certain air territories, in certain parts of the medieval world, never sort of the whole uh, uniformly, but um, there were periods when some parts of the middle of the, mid, of the medieval church did go through a dark age, and especially the 10th century uh, was a dark age of the papacy. The papacy sank into a real um, crisis at the time. The alliance with the Carolingians, Frankish rulers, uh, worked very well, but as the Carolingian Empire was disintegrating, uh, this also had a very detrimental effect on uh, the papacy. Because the power struggles that uh, were sort of the, the consequence of this political social disintegration also affect, affected the papacy. Now, it's usually said, uh, said that the Carolingian Empire ends definitively with the uh, death of uh, the Emperor Charles the Fat, as he was known, in the year 888, so 888. And then uh, there was a struggle for the continuity of the imperial throne, and some of the popes were um, involved. And that um, forms the background to one of the low points in the history of the papacy, the so-called Cadaver Synod of uh, the year 870, and 897, 897. So the background is the struggle for the um, imperial um, throne. Pope Formosus, who was pope from 891 to 896, um, who actually had some merits in, in attracting uh, the Bulgarians to, to uh, Western uh, Christianity. Um, uh, he allied uh, um, himself um, with one particular sort of claimant to the, to the imperial throne, and after his death, um, in 896, um, there was a short-lived successor, Boniface the Sick, who died after 15 uh, days, he was very ill when he already was elected. And then uh, the next pope, Stephen the Sick, was a long-time rival of Pope Formosus, and also, um, so again, took the other side in the struggle for the succession to the imperial throne. So, and that, uh, so Stephen VI uh, hated uh, Pope Formosus, and um, in 897 um, put the dead Pope on trial by opening up the tomb of Pope Formosus, having his body exhumed, uh, putting him in up in a, in a chair, putting him on trial, allegedly for supporting the claims of um, King Arnulf of Carinthia to become um, emperor, to succeed as emperor, and for, for coveting the papacy and a number of other charges and uh, trumped up charges. So, a corpse was literally being uh, put on trial, propped up. Um, there were the speeches of the, you know, the, 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 the prosecution, uh, the defense. Um, and a very bizarre, very macabre spectacle uh, uh, continued, and in the end, unsurprisingly, Formosus was found guilty, uh, and he was, uh, his body was tossed in the Tiber. It was later was recovered by monks and actually secretly buried in, in their monastery. So a very, very bizarre spectacle, which uh, really began um, a, a period of, of crisis, of decadence, of decline um, of the papacy. The uh, papacy, for 
for decades became um, the, the um, object of the greed of Roman aristocratic families who thought they had a claim to it, they would fight against uh, one another, bribe, uh, kill uh, uh, one another. There were some popes who uh, we hear were more murdered, some were found uh, uh, caught up in scandals. It's difficult to um, reconstruct that story um, in detail because a lot of the sources we actually have are quite biased and one of the uh, major chroniclers of the time, Liutprand of Cremona, Cremona in northern Italy, was uh, decidedly anti-papal and uh, so one can't trust everything he writes, but it was really a low point the papacy had reached at the time. One example would be the um, election of um, a the, of John the Twelfth, who was Pope from 955 to 964. Uh, he is uh, he is a member of the Roman family of the Theophylact, so an aristocratic family. And well, the age is disputed, but some sources say he was. 16 years old when he was elected Pope. He was 16 years old. Um, this is also the background from which the legend, the legend of Pope Joan emerges, right? So that uh, story that uh, is, is a woman was elected Pope and then gave birth in, uh, to a child in a procession. So this is this real period of confusion and, and, and uh, uh, crisis from which that story also emerges. So it has to be seen with a lot, a lot of uh, scepticism, whatever you hear uh, about that. Now, how did the papacy emerge from that crisis, and not through its own um, power, but uh, through the interve intervention of uh, the German kings? It was Otto I, before he was actually crowned um, um, uh, emperor, he actually, as he was coming to Rome to be crowned emperor, after his great victory on uh, the River Lech near Augsburg in 955. It was John, the Pope, uh, it was Otto I um, in 962, who simply had John the Twelfth, the sort of boy Pope, if he was really as young as some sources say, who had him simply deposed, and he appointed uh, a, re a respectable, a, a proper um, a successor. So the German kings or German emperors simply appointed uh, the subsequent popes. And again, um, uh, that, that shows this, their own understanding uh, of sacred, uh, sacred rule. And um, in a way, really, the popes were integrated into the imperial church in um, Germany. And uh, at least you could say it, it made sure that uh, the papacy was not in the hands of the rival uh, aristocratic families in Rome who would, would have no scruples to, to, uh, to use uh, violence and um, to attain their uh, objectives. Now, during the period, um, it may surprise you that the papacy as an institution did not really suffer uh, in its reputation. Um, even when uh, individual popes uh, really were very questionable um, uh, figures, that is John the Twelfth, uh, the papacy continued to benefit uh, from well, the saints uh, who were the apostles, uh, who were whose tombs were venerated in Rome, Saint Peter, uh, Saint Paul, and many other holy sites of Rome, um, the magnificent magnificent buildings. Uh, the, the, the wonderful liturgy that was, that, that was still carried out. So Rome, the idea of Rome was actually not affected by the real crisis that happened. Of course, communication was very slow, you know, not to speak of so, uh, uh, Twitter or Facebook, but I mean, you, uh, um, even so, uh, older form of communications from the modern period were well, existent, obviously, so news traveled very slowly. And um, although individual popes were hardly um, sort of great political or uh, religious uh, or spiritual leaders, uh, the papacy still uh, had a strong prestige. This was then a period when, when um, um, evangelization in Scandinavia uh, uh, set off, certainly with an idea of, of linking yourself with uh, the Church of Rome, the Church of the Apostles, St. Peter and, and Paul.
And it was also um, through that connection with Rome that uh, a religious revival, especially a monastic revival, um, happened with uh, the founding of the monastery of Cluny in, in Burgundy. In the meantime, also, um, the political and social situation in northern and western Europe became more stable. So while this was a um, dark age of the papacy, it, it wasn't a dark age, uh, certainly in, 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 in Germany. Um, it meant that the centers um, uh, of culture, of art, also uh, of religious life, were found uh, in the north of the Alps, monasteries such as Reichenau or Mainz or Fulda, um, uh, and um, great episcopal sees of um, well, the, the East Francia and also to some, to some extent West Francia, west of the River Rhine. Um, so, I'd like to uh, conclude here really. Um, with an outlook towards our next um, topic, which will then be the uh, revival that um, is associated particularly with the founding of Cluny, a revival of monastic life that had consequences far beyond uh, the uh, monastic institutions. And in fact, is only one example among others of a true renewal of, of religious life in, in this period. And that then brought its reforming impulse also south of the Alps and led to the revival of the papacy, reinst uh, so restating uh, the uh, true spiritual and religious um, authority of the popes. So thank you very much.